Buen día a todos. <coughs> Voy a hablar en inglés porque no sé cómo hablar en español. Toda esta presentación tiene palabras en inglés, entonces mejor que hablo en inglés. Pero después si tienen preguntas a mí, puedo, si hablas despacio, puedo entender algo y puedo hablar contigo en español. Y la gente de, de, de Brasil que hablan en portugués, disculpe, pero no falla portugués ni nada. Ok, <coughs> empezamos. Uh, ¿Qué hablamos hoy? Es de mi experiencia de cómo eran en CIO de Berkeley. When I was CIO there uh, for 10 years, I worked with uh, one of the largest universities in the United States uh, to help transform the technology of the campus. But over the last several years, it became more and more difficult for Berkeley to change by itself. It didn't matter how much we worked, how much we spent, we couldn't do it by ourselves. We had to do it together, with more universities working together. So in 2008, 2009, uh, I wrote a paper with a colleague from the University of Indiana. Indiana University as uh, Vice President of Technology, Brad Wheeler. He's also the uh, professor in the School of Business. And he and I discussed how will education change, how will our universities change if we're able to work above the network, above the individual campus together? Because that was the direction everything was going. And this paper is available online. Uh, if, if you Google it, uh, you will find uh, it available at Educause. And what we discussed was that everything was changing. You had changes in, in, in the money, in the way things were going to be funded in education. You had changes in the technology platforms. You had changes in the way you would teach, the way you would engage with your students. And of course, you had changes because nothing stayed in a classroom. It was global. And again, it didn't matter whether you were a small school or a big school. It was all going to be global. Now, on the technology platform, we all know that there are many, many companies. ¿Se puede leer todo eso? In the Silicon Valley, every day, there's another 10 or 20 companies that are of interest to the education community. 10 a day. How can we keep up with that? There's that many new companies because they don't need a lot of money to start. You can start a company using Amazon or using uh, Microsoft or using uh, Rackspace or Google or others as your computing platform and you don't need a lot of capital. You don't need a lot of money to start, which means the ability for new companies to come along is accelerating, is moving forward very quickly in Latin America, in, in, in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, everywhere. And so you know these are going to be happening faster and faster, and you don't need uh, to do a lot of work to reach the community because everybody has a computer in their hand now, right? With mobile devices, every one of the students, every one of the faculty has what they need to access the world in their hand. In teaching, if you don't think about the fact that they all have access to the world in their hand, you're going to be teaching the same way you taught since Socrates. We have to think about it differently. We have to change. You have to change so that the classroom and the instructor is reversed. They can learn, the students can learn online, the material, but not without a, fa a professor. But the professor doesn't need to be the one to share all the materials because it's all there. It's all online. What you need is to change the way the students interact with each other and the way the faculty member interacts with the students. And with the networks that we have, it doesn't have to be in the same place. That doesn't mean it's good today or perfect today, but with the networks getting better and better, and the cost of technology going down and down, if you don't change the way you teach to use that, the students will go past you. They will find other ways. We all know that the, when, uh, 
that uh, the costs for education are going up. And the reason the costs for education are going up when technology is coming down is because education today is dominated by people. And people cost more. Technology costs less, but people cost more. So if, if you have all your people in education and it's going up uh, and your money is going down, you have to change the way you work. Every other industry in the world has changed using technology. Healthcare, manufacturing, finance, education, a little bit. We will have to change. Doesn't mean we like it, but we have to change. Because the economics are changing very, very quickly. And whenever you're not sure which way to go, follow the money. And the money is going into technology to support education. And that means that as you change the way you teach and the way you fund, the way the money comes, the borders, the difference between one country and another will change. They won't be there. A student in Colombia will be able to take a course from Chile as easy as a student in Cartagena can take a course from Bogota. The distance won't matter. If we have the networks, if Red Clara has the networks, if Renata has the networks, that will support that. And increasingly, in countries around the world, they are investing more in research and education networks to do just that. Because then they can reach all of their people. But does, does education in the cloud work? Does it really matter? Yeah, it's like, okay, they can read in the cloud, they can do work in the cloud. But it matters if you are the director of technology of ICT in your universities, you matter. Either you will help make this happen or you will be in the way. There's no middle place. You have to decide, are you going to maintain what you do today and do nothing different? Or are you going to help make this tra transition? You will have many faculty members and students that will say the cloud is bad, it's not safe, it's not secure, teaching in the classroom is better, I want to be with people directly, I don't want to watch on, on my phone. But with the economics being so different, if you don't help make this change in five years, you probably won't be in that same job. Well, somebody may help you change jobs. Why? <laughs> because of this. In 2010, $24 billion market uh, for cloud. 2014, this slide is a year old, uh, two years old now, uh, 2011. They thought it would be about 88 billion. It's much more than that already. This is ICT it, at a, a business or inside a company in 2010 and a little bit of cloud. ICT inside grew some, still there, but look at cloud. Follow the money, okay? This is going to transform how we can use educa uh, technology in education. This is the growth of cloud computing uh, from February of this year from Gardner, okay? In 2010, 77 billion. Now re remember, in this slide, in 2011, they thought it would be 88 billion. By uh, now, in 2013, it's 131 billion. They were only off by 50 million yeah, in two years. It's growing much faster than anybody could predict. Faster than the web grew originally, faster than client server grew originally. It's growing faster than every other platform. Not because it's better, but because it's cheaper. And always, after cheaper, it will get better, but will stay less expensive. This line is the percentage of growth. So by 2016, it will only grow 15%.
but 15% on 210 billion. So by 2017, a quarter of a trillion dollars. That's real money. I only want a little bit of that money. But in your organizations, in your departments, how many of us still think of, of ICT like this? It's, it's a craft. We carefully put everything together. We create it all. We have jobs so that they can do this part and this part, system administrators, database administrators, network administrators, programmer, uh, programmers in one language in Java, programmers in Ruby, programmers in C++, programmer. We always do this like it's a craft because that has been our careers. I used to be able to program too a long time ago. I started that way. And you have a sense of pride when you create it. So one of the biggest barriers to using the cloud in the right way is thinking that we're better doing it this way. It doesn't mean that there won't be places to do it this way, but if you keep doing it this way, you will be passed. Because this is very expensive and it won't scale. When we try to do it, it looks like this. Well, it did in my data center. I'm sure yours is better than this. It's because each time you need to grow, you don't know when that will be. So you add something new, and then you add something new, and then you add something new. And pretty soon it looks like this. It's your nightmare. All, all of you in, in ICT, you, you wake up worrying about this. And so then you say, OK, I won't do this anymore. We'll do this much better. It'll be, it'll be perfect. It'll look like this. Maybe for one day it would look like this. Yeah, I think this picture was taken before it opened. But still, even if you do it perfect, it's not cloud scale. Even if you're very, very large and you have a giant data center like this, it's tiny compared to the cloud. So no matter how much we work one at a time, will your data center ever look like this? OK? This is a new uh, 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 second generation data center design. OK? These, are, these individual things are this. This is the size of a big semi-trailer truck. It has 6,600 servers. And you don't change the individual servers. You, you drive them in and you plug it into a bus. Oops, sorry. You plug it into a bus like this. And when one dies, you unplug all 6,600 and plug in a new one. Do you do that at your universities? The cooling towers. Yeah. They will use modern advanced techniques that will be much more energy efficient. They will put data centers like this where there's hydropower so that they use much less electricity. Because in the end, these are getting to such scale that really they're just about reselling electricity. The computing is almost free. So can you do this at your, at your university? This facility is 200 megawatts, one data center. My beautiful data center at Berkeley was two megawatts. And I was going to make it bigger to four megawatts. But I changed my mind. Because can I ever do this? Because no matter how hard we try, the people that we have still use the tools that they started with. And so when you go to build a data center, they look at all their tools and they say, hmm, how can I do that? You will not build this with this. You need to change your skills, your 
thinking of what it is you do for a living. What is your job? Because your job is not to build it. Your job is to deliver it, is to provide it, is to advance it. So we used to think about projects where we would do development. And you would start here, and what are the requirements, and then you would build over a month, and then you would test. Okay? This would take, for most of us, this takes months. Right? And then you have to do testing and testing and testing. When I never had to do testing because my code was always perfect. But for some of you, I'm sure you, you should test. And then what do you do? Well, you have to figure out when it's okay to put the code in or when you're going to change things. And at your university, I'm sure it's easy to get everybody to agree what day it's okay to make a change or go take something offline, right? Everybody agrees always. That at Berkeley, always, really, really easy, right? And then sometimes you have to take everything down to put in the new thing. New computers maybe or new, new software or make a big change, upgrade, right? And then you have, to, you have to watch it all the time. You have to monitor it all the time, right? You have to make sure that you're there 24 hours a day, on the weekends, on the holidays. When you could be in Cartagena at the beach, no, you have to be there inside your data center. Right? And then you have to have somebody there to answer the phone and say, what, what went wrong? Was it here or here or here or here or here? All the way back, maybe, maybe it was way back there. Six months ago, you made a decision that was bad. That cannot be the way we do technology anymore. You have to change from months to minutes. Not a little change, a very, very big change. You have to do automated testing that's always doing the testing. Use the computers to do the testing, not the people. You have to do automated deployments of software. So when you're ready to use the new version of software, it's automatically deploying. And it's not deploying to everybody at the same time. It's deploying to this group, and then the next group, and then, oh, there's a problem. It automatically goes back. You have to have automated testing. You can never take systems down anymore. What happens when you go to Google and Google isn't there? You, you can't work, you can't function, I, you can't find anything anymore. Because you expect it to be there all the time. It's like dial tone used to be. You pick up the phone, you always knew you could make a phone call. Now you can't make phone calls with cell phones, but you can find Google. And you know you can find things. You have to release new software every week or every other week. You don't do a project that takes you 18 months you do a project that you work on all the time. Are you prepared to make those changes? Are your teams prepared to make those changes? Because the changes you need to make are not about technology anymore. They're only about the work, the education, the pedagogy, the research, the administration. They're not about the technology. Nobody cares if you're using version 11.0.4.7, ah, uh -uh and you have to change to 11.0.7b, they don't care. You don't know what version of Google you're using. So you have to move faster. And you have to move to the cloud. Right? You have to do step by step every day. You have to be able to measure and monitor what you're doing. And you have to do it with a big group. Because trying to do it with one person, you can't do. So think about if you keep building the way we used to, you may have one good building here and one bad building and one other building, right? But it's too much work to do one at a time, right? And even if we all do it, all we're doing is the same thing over and over and over again. And they don't necessarily work together. So you need to think about doing it differently, right? This is more like Cartagena, eh? like that, right? We have to share, right? We have to do things fast. And the only way to do that is doing it within a community cloud. We have to have a research and education cloud just like we had to have 
a research and education network. Now is the time to change thinking about our network as the most important part and think about the network as a part of all of that we provide to all of the educational community. So what do we do today? You have one group that does something very good, and then you have another group that does something very good, and then you have another group that does something very good, but then they just do it again, right? We need to use the networks like bridges. We need to dr bring the barriers down so that if you have a good, a great course in a university in Ecuador, they can use it in Panama, just like if they have a good piece of technology in Brazil, they can use it in Mexico. You can change very easily because you have to have the network. And that's what we're doing with Net Plus. We're making it so that anything that is built at any of your universities can be made available as easily as you make available Google. So you can just get it online. Because you know what? If you don't make it available, your students and your faculty will find it on their cell phones. Now this is, this is the cloud, all the pieces of the cloud. So what we have done with Net Plus and, and, and Internet 2 is we have created the ability, all of these parts, okay, are how we make it work together. This is the most important thing. You have to have federated identity. If you don't have federated identity, then it will be just like it is today where you have to have, uh, the, you know, go cross a, a border and you have to have all your documents and you have to, it's very slow. And the web, you need it to be very, very fast. Federated identity will do that. So if you don't have federated identity, this is the place to start. Because then you can connect your student, your faculty, to the world very easily. And federated identity in education can protect the privacy of the individual. You don't want to use Facebook as your identity for all your education. It may work, but at what price? We have to be responsible for helping protect the privacy of the individuals. And of course, you need a good network. Internet 2 now is, uh, has our universities at 100 gig. It's a good idea if you are not thinking about how you're going to get to more capacity to be thinking about it because you can't do this without a good network. And you have to take and make sure that all the services that you're developing, you expect to be used by somebody else in the world. In the universities in the United States, there is nothing we design today that we don't believe would be used by one of you in the future. Because the universities don't have borders. The faculty work across the world. The students work with everybody across the world. They create groups one day, and two days later, another group they can create. So you have to create everything to be federated. So what we did, let me skip this, is we created Net Plus to make it easy so that it could be about research and education. Because the worst thing to do is to create something for the private sector that doesn't understand education. But today, because we are working very closely with all the cloud providers together as a group, they will work with us to change it for all of us in education and research. Because 90% of what you need at one university is the same that you need at another. But when you ask our teams, our technical teams, what do they always say? Well, we're different. We're, we're special. Our university isn't the same as the other university. OK, you want to be different and special? Wear different clothes, but use the same federated identity and use the same cloud. Because those things are not different, and they will make everybody's life better. So we work with them, and they have to work under the same schedule for everybody. We have the standards that all of the cloud providers have to work with. And they all, it, this is the federation in the United States. It's called In Common. We have six million students now using In Common. And when they log in to Amazon, they can log in with their university identity and use cloud services with the identity from their university instead of having to create yet another identity. So the way we do it is we work with all, our internet too is education, research, and labs. 
and then we share with all the small schools, museums, libraries. And now we are working with global partners. And we will be adding Latin American partners to us right now. CUDI in Mexico represents the Latin American community as we start to expand this around the world. And it's not about the United States. It's about a global solution for education because that's how we're going to work in the future. Uh, okay, I think we wanted to leave some time for questions. These are some of the pieces of software that we have written. All of these are available to all of you. They're all um, open source, community source that we have written. Some of them, uh, like Shibboleth, uh, is with uh, the Swiss, Switch, uh, Janet in the UK. Uh, we have people in, in Chile that are working on this. So there, there are people around the world that are participating in these projects. And that creates trust so that we can make sure uh, that we are working together. What we have decided is we are going to expand and change EduGain, which is the European Federation standard, to be the primary single federated identity standard for all cloud services. And so we would like participation from your community to make sure it will work for Latin America as well. Okay, um, just so you know what it is and the services, this is, uh, gives you some idea. Uh, you start with identity and access management. Well, you start with the network. I, I hope everybody here has a good network. I know in Colombia they do, Renata's network is very nice. Then you work with infrastructure providers and platform providers. Right now that's Amazon, Microsoft, Rackspace, and others. And we are creating services specially for the education and research community where we don't have to pay for the network with them because we already pay for it. We don't have to do uh, uh, separate accounts because we already have federated identity. We get special pricing, we get special services, because we do it once for everybody. Same thing with software, working with Adobe, working with <coughs> uh, uh, LMS providers like Canvas. Voice, video, and collaborations, as everything moves to the, the next model, all of this becomes software. Right? No, nobody who needs a video conference needs to go to a room anymore. You can use a video conference on your phone now, or on your tablet, on your iPad. And so we're blending all of these together. And then finally, over here, all of the content that is needed is going to be part of the network. With software-defined networking, you'll be able to have one university use content from another university. All the museums will begin digitizing their collections. So we have a partnership with the Smithsonian University sorry, Smith University, I think of them as a university, Smithsonian Museum, to digitize their collection, all 137 million objects, so that every student anywhere in the world connected to the research network can use those objects as if they were visiting the Smithsonian. That's how we see the future of, of cloud services in education. So I think we just have a few minutes. Let me open it up for any questions. I don't know if there's uh, microphones or, and, and you can ask in Spanish, somebody will tell me what you're saying, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pause there. <laughs>